Oh, it's so nice to be in front of so many people. This is actually my second post-pandemic. Uh, I was speaking in ACE in 2014, not in such a big screen, um, where I was talking about why change is hard. Um, and now I'm here again, and I'm really enjoying being here live. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about psychological safety and talk a little bit about what it is. But I'm also going to talk especially why it's hard for us when we have some sort of crisis. So this is me. I am Native Wired on Twitter. Be aware that uh, I tweet a lot. Uh, my pronouns is she and her. Um, and the reason I have them here is because I saw at a conference where a male speaker had his pronouns. And I was like, oh, why do you have that? And he said, well, there are many people where they have pronouns like Paul said, where, but where they're afraid to speak up. And if we normalize stating who we are and what our pronouns are, it will be easier for everyone to state what they actually want to have as pronouns. Because you never know. Um, even though we can guess a lot of the time, uh, assumption is the mother of all fuck-ups. So, as Paul said, I'm an agile coach. The reason I have the hug tree hugging part is because some people joke that some agile coaches are tree hugging. All we care about is just love and nice post-its. Uh, and yes, that will take us very far. My main coaching tools is caring about people and truly listening to them. I have the last year become a manager. So I'm a manager at Mentimeter where I am the manager of right now 11 engineers from someone still at university to the oldest person in the organization, which means 53, because we are a very young organization. And I am also a speaker. I speak at conferences. This is from my university, where I was lucky enough to give the graduation talk for computer science in the year where my cousin finished the same study as me. So that was, that was big. But I'm a lot more. I'm also a big hugger. Uh, the picture see here um, shows me hugging a person at a conference. I never met this person except for this picture. So she came up, opened her arms, I gave her a hug, and then someone sent me the picture later. Um, because I believe hugging is a way of paying attention to a person. And it doesn't have to be a physical hug. I love that we have the stickers we can put on here where you can say, hey, I actually like the two meter distance. Uh, and I think that's one of the good things that came out of Corona is that we can now indicate this. Because we had people who felt uncomfortable being close to people before. And it's a good way for us to show what do we actually prefer. Uh, I'm also an organizer of the German coach camp and have been for many years. It's, um, this year it's gonna be four days where we meet in a venue in the forest and we have open space for four days and discuss whatever comes up, which is mostly agile, but not always. Um, and by the way, we have a few places for June um, advertising. And I am known for my courage as well. Um, and my courage also means showing vulnerability because I think that's part of how we create safety. It's part of how we interact with people is to show our own vulnerability because that allows other people to maybe open up as well. So why am I talking about this psychological safety? Well, the main reason is because I care about this. Most of my life, even though I didn't realize it, I've been working with psychological safety. I've been working with helping people feel safe enough to be in a space. Whether it was when I was a kid or as I was growing up, I worked with helping people feel safe. Part of what I do at the coach camp is I talk about feeling safe enough to be yourself, feeling safe enough to say, yo, yes, so, yo, yeah, sorry. Feeling safe enough to say yes, but also feeling safe enough to say no and jumping into things. Um, and then in 2017, together with Morgan, I was working in a company who decided we want to put focus on psychological safety. 
So they had this aspiration that we want a psychologically safe environment that enables trust and an open collaborative culture. And this was the first time I heard the term psychological safety. I watched a TED talk by Amy Edmondson, and the links to that is also in here. And I was like, this is brilliant. And one of the things I also love about Amy is she doesn't just talk about why it's nice for us to feel safe. She talks about why it enables our companies to be more innovative, more creative, and actually be better companies. So what we did was we worked very hard on this. We made introductions, went into each team, talked to them about what is psychological safety? What does it mean to us in our daily lives? The next quarter we worked on giving feedback because we realized that was one of the things you people really struggled with. Whether it was um, feedback on code or it was feedback on something else, people really struggled to give but also to receive. And then we used like a retrospective format to dive into this. Um, and then I've just been working with it since and becoming more and more explicit about working on it. Uh, and last year I was lucky enough to uh, write a chapter in a book about team safety. So the art of agile development that came out last year in the second edition, I wrote a piece on safety. Uh, and when I was asked, I kind of go, oh, why me? Because that's one of the things is I also doubt, like um, I only know a few things. I, you know, I don't know all the theory, but I do know enough apparently to be asked to write a chapter in a book. The interesting thing about psychological safety is that it's not really new. And I mean, we've had focus on physical safety for very long. We have companies who have rules about you have to hold the banister when you go up the stairs. You have to wear a hard hat when you go into uh, an area where they're building stuff. Um, but it seems like we haven't really looked into psychological safety. So the first mentioning I have found of psychological safety is from 1965, where, okay, I forgot the names, but it's in there, <laughs> where, where they were doing experiments with people, not experiments, but they were researching what is the best learning environment. And what they learned was that to have the best learning environment, you need to be a bit uncomfortable. But that the big difference of the people who learned and the people who didn't was if they had psychologically safety in that environment. Was it okay to try out new things? And not much happened. Then in 1990, uh, Khan went out and talked about how we need this psychological safety. And still, I haven't seen much about things actually happening. Same in our industry. And then a good thing happened was that Google started looking into what creates a high-performing team? What are the elements that are present when we have a high-performing team? And what they started out with looking into is like, what is the level of education that we have? What, how many engineers do we have? Like, um, how many senior do we have, etc.? And what they found out was that it didn't make any difference. The things that made difference were the people things. So, did the team's members feel like they had meaningful work? Were they actually contributing to something meaningful? Did they see the impact of their work? Did they know that whatever they did, it had an impact on the work that they were working on? They had good structures and clarity. Doesn't mean that they necessarily had tons of processes, but they knew what was expected of them. They knew what they were supposed to, and if they had different roles in the team, that was very clear. They were dependable, meaning that they would deliver, and if they didn't deliver, they would speak up about it. They would inform their stakeholders. But the thing that made the single most difference was psychological safety. The teams that were the most psychologically safe were the teams that performed the best. And this is not true for all teams in Google. There are places in Google where this is not true. There are places in Google where this is true. I think in all big organizations you will find this. But I think the most important thing about this is that Google kind of 
brought it to the table of IT. Because when Google does this, and especially high-performing teams, because that's what we all want, then we listen to it. And what they were working on was based on some of the work of Amy Edmondson, who is a professor working on psychological safety, using some of her questions, which uh, were also some of the same things that Morgan and I looked at. And you can actually go into Google and you can find all the information about this. You can find questions. You can find examples of how am I a good leader if I want to create psychological safety. So now I said psychological safety a lot of times. And there are a few definitions of it. I really like this one. Psychological safety is being able to show and employ oneself without fear of negative consequence of self-image, status, or career. Because for me, this captures the essence. The essence is the fear. Where we can go in with psychological safety and we can say, Okay, we have stairs without a banister. We need to put a banister up so people can hold on to that. Psychological safety is inside ourselves, and it's inside the individual. And it's about the fear that we have. It doesn't mean that that thing will happen. And like Paul was talking about, he didn't talk about his disability for many years because he was afraid of what would happen. And that didn't come true. When he actually started talking about it, people went like, oh, now I'm going to introduce myself when I talk to him so that he remembers. But that doesn't change the fear. And that's interesting because this is also about, it can be fear of being fired, but it can also just be fear of status. It can be fear of how you see yourself, that this will be damaged. One of the things we found out when I was working with Morgan was that a lot of our senior developers did not feel safe enough to ask questions because they were supposed to know everything because they were senior. And we don't know everything. We keep forgetting things because we don't use it or just because we forget things because our brain is not that smart always. Um, so this is what it is. It's about showing yourself, being yourself, speaking up without fear of negative consequences. That's what safety means. Safety is not always comfort. So one of the big misunderstandings I hear is that say, a safe place is a comfortable place. Um, but like they found out in the first um, survey or what do you call the research about psychological safety is we need to actually not be comfortable to learn. So if we look at the comfort zone, this is nice. This is where we like to be. This is where our brain likes to be. We know what we're doing. But the problem is that we are not changing in here. That's part of it is we know exactly what's going to happen. And I always recommend go back here once in a while. It's good to learn and improve, but sometimes it's just good to know everything. It's a little bit like watching this movie that you watched 10 times already or reading the same book because you know exactly what's going to happen. And then we have the learning zone or the growth zone, which is where we move a little bit outside. Not so much that it's really scary, but enough that we don't feel comfortable anymore. This is not nice. But we still feel safe enough here. And that's where we truly grow. This is where we truly learn. And in a workplace, this is also where we want to be sometimes. We want to have those discussions in the teams where we talk about what we believe in. And if we all agreed, that would be boring and we would not get the interesting products that we do or the interesting conversations. Um, and if you have a team where you feel safe, it's okay to do that. It's okay as the one coming in directly from university to actually say to the most senior person there going like, I'm not sure I agree with you. Uh, I see it more as going this way. That's what safety is about. And then, of course, there is the danger zone. This is where you will push yourself if you stay in the learning or growth zone for too long. You will go into the danger zone. This is where our brain reacts. This is where you will get stress. For instance, uh, not healthy stress, but the bad stress. 
Um, so we don't want to go out there, and that's also why I say remember to also come back to the comfort zone. But it's also about that it's okay to make mistakes. Let's say you are a developer and you take the whole system down so that nobody can use your product for a day. That is not going to be comfortable. But we want that to be safe. Because if it's not safe, your brain goes into panic and you can't learn from it. If it's safe, we can have discussions, we can start learning from it, what went wrong, and we can move on from it. And that's part of it. So it's not always comfort. So this is from Amy Edmondson about some of the things that psychological safety would help us with. So one of the things it helps us with is asking questions, which is a big part of how we learn, of how we experience things. And you kind of go like, yeah, but it's natural to ask questions. But sometimes we don't, because we don't want to look ignorant. We are afraid if I ask this, we will look ignorant. There's something called the core protocols, um, which is from research at Microsoft. And one of the things is don't look stupid or don't do something stupid on purpose. And when I first read that, it's kind of like, I don't do that. But I realized that one of the things that I do is if I don't catch people's name the second time, I don't ask again because it's embarrassing that I can't remember their names. That is doing something stupid on purpose. So to not be embarrassing, you don't ask for the name. So now I started asking for names several times. But that's just an example. At work, sometimes we don't ask questions because we feel like we're supposed to know this, or at home for that matter. So if we have that safety, it will help us ask the questions that we need to ask. It's about admitting mistakes and taking responsibility for it. And again, instead of hiding them because we are afraid we will look incompetent, so the research that Amy Edmondson talks about in her TED talk, the first one she did, she talks about going into a hospital and looking at medical errors. Like, how many medical errors do we have by department? And what is the working environment? And when she saw the results, it showed almost correlation between the, the departments with the best working environment had the most medical errors. The ones with the worst working environment had the fewest medical errors. So she had someone go in and repeat the research because it seemed totally wrong. What turned out was that in the ones with the good working environments, they wrote down the medical errors, they learned from their medical errors, they admitted their mistakes because it was safe for them. In the departments where they had a bad working environment, they didn't admit these things because they were afraid they would be punished or ridiculed. So part of what it helps us with is actually admitting these mistakes. And we need to admit them so we can start working on them. It's also about offering ideas instead of being afraid to, lose intru uh, to be intrusive. That somebody who is above us in some way, it can be seniority, it can be a different education, it can be having a manager position, someone who founded a company, that you don't speak up because they must know best. So this idea that I have, maybe it's not so good. And if we have this, we can start offering those ideas. And it's also about challenging norms. Sometimes we have norms that we have just because they made sense 20 years ago, and we didn't challenge them. And I think one of the things that's happening at the moment is we're challenging a lot of norms. But what we also see is that a lot of companies go like, okay, Corona's over, back to the office because people don't work at home. Uh, we believe in having people in the office and that's a strategic choice that we have made. But it's not because we don't believe people don't work at home. It's because we believe there, there is a serendipity when you talk to people, when you meet people um, that you won't get if you don't, um, if you don't physically meet. But sometimes these norms do not make sense. I mean, I couldn't imagine all the stuff that happened during the pandemic. The fact that we could have conferences online, which I still don't like too much, but we could actually communicate, we could actually meet online. We couldn't do that probably before Corona because we didn't have to. And now we have new norms. 
But challenging norms, whatever they are, um, is one of the things that this will help us with. And sometimes we just sit back because we don't want to be the negative one. We don't want to be the one that says, hey, this is not a good way of doing it. And of course, we need to think about how we say it. If we say, I see why you're doing this. I think we can do it even better. Um, that helps and helps people listen to us. But we can also create an environment where you can't challenge this. And that's one of the, the problems with a lot of companies when we don't focus on these things. So this is um, about the Boeing 787. I keep forgetting which one. So basically, there are tons of bugs, physical and software bugs, in this plane. People got fired or bullied when they raised concerns. The plane was not pulled back until the second plane fell down. This literally killed people because the people at the company did not feel safe enough to speak up. Or when they tried, they were pushed down so hard that they didn't. This is also what lack of psychological safety can do. It literally kills people sometimes. Do we need psychological safety? Some of the things that I've heard is we don't need psychological safety. Psychological safety is for the people who are weak. It's for the people who are not very good at what they do. Like if you are a great developer, a great manager, you will just leave an unsafe place and you will get a new job. That's not how it works. No matter how amazing you are at your job, you can still be afraid to speak up. Maybe because you are amazing at your job, you are afraid that if you say something wrong, then you are not the great person you are anymore. You might lose your self-image, but you might also feel like you might get fired. What if I make a wrong mistake? I'm a level X something, and if I make a mistake? So it's very, very relevant. There's also the part about, like some of the things that happened early in, in COVID was that all of a sudden, some companies had to close. We just saw Netflix just fired a bunch of people. You might lose your job if you speak up. So if you don't have a safe environment and you have mouths to feed and mortgage to pay, then you might not feel safe enough to speak up. So I'm lucky in the way that I'm single and have no kids. That means that basically, if I don't like my job, I can just leave. If things go really wrong, I will move back to Denmark and stay with my friends for a bit. That gives me a choice to just leave whenever I want. But not everyone is privileged enough to have that choice. And not privileged enough to be able to challenge the things, or safe enough to challenge the things at their companies. So this is from a talk uh, by my friend Torbjörn who says, thing become so much better when we accept them as they are, not as we want them to be. That doesn't mean that we should accept everything, because we shouldn't, we should challenge things. But it means that we need to accept what is right now. That's the only way we can change it. If we have a company, sorry, I'll just rewind. I forgot my thoughts. Um, yeah, one of the things I've heard as an Agile coach a few times, for instance, is I expect people to be grown-ups. And grown-ups speak up, grown-ups take responsibility. Yeah, that's very nice. And if we were all perfect human beings without any trauma or anything, yes, we would always speak up if there was something wrong. We would always step up and take responsibility. We would do all those things. But we are not. We are not magical beings who do all these things. Maybe you had a company a long time ago where if you spoke up, you were told off or you didn't get a pay raise. We learn these things. Or maybe something happened when you were a kid that makes you feel unsafe. Maybe um, the fact that you are a woman in IT can make it difficult because some people don't listen to you. Like one of the things I experience, for instance, is if I say something technical, people don't always pay attention because I'm one of the soft, agile coaches. Yeah, but I'm also a computer scientist who wrote about routing protocols in mobile networks and implemented one of the first ones for computers that moved. 
which most people don't know. But they should still respect me and listen to what I say. I, don't, I shouldn't have to pull out that card. So we need to accept that things are like this, and then we can start changing them. We can't change things if we go around and think everything is just ideal. We need to be able to accept them. So I also said I would be talking about crisis. Because safety becomes more important and more difficult when we are in crisis. When I talked about this the first time, it was in, I think, May 2020. I was just going to talk about this once because Corona would soon be over. Or we thought so. We had a pandemic where in the beginning we didn't know. What is this? How long is it going to last? I had a lot of people that I was coaching who broke down when we came to summer because they were like, this is going to last a few months and then we're going to go back to normal. We had people who stayed home alone and who didn't see anyone. I, when I went home for Christmas 2020, I hadn't spoken to a person for 27 days that was not on a screen. I was going crazy. We also had people who had to stay home with their partners and kids and dogs and everything because they were sent home. They were never alone. Which meant that if they were going to have a meeting, there might be someone crying or barking or, Mom or Dad, I want this. Um, and in the beginning, we were not used to this. Now, I feel like a lot of us, at least, are used to, yeah, there will be a kid sitting on the lap of someone if they need to. But it was something that we were not used to. We didn't know how to do these things. And it became unsafe for some people, especially with the videos. And while other people might feel safe when they can see people on a screen, there's also things like, would you like to show your home? Are you okay with that? Maybe you have to sit in a children's room and do these things, and if you are very hardcore something, that might not be what you want to show. Now we have backgrounds, um, but like my computer is from 2013, it doesn't do backgrounds. Uh, and I will get a new one, but it still works, so I don't really have an excuse. Um, so all of a sudden, you had to do these things where you might not want to show how you live. You might not want to bring that part of yourself to work. Things became unsafe in that way as well. And there's the whole thing about being professional. And the way we often talk about being professional is dressing in a specific way, acting in a specific way. And having to attend to a kid, a lot of people don't see as professional. And yes, it's annoying sometimes. But it's also life. And if we can have an environment where we can talk about that thing, these things, it will help us to create a safer environment so we can actually get the things that we want. Our brains got affected because we didn't know what was going on we were kind of put into a state of alert, permanent alert position. What's going on? Depending on how you felt about the pandemic, you would be terrified to go outside, or you would go be like, yeah, whatever, I'm young, I will go outside. And we didn't know. We didn't know who was what. And it strains our brain. And worst of all, we didn't know when this was going to end. We still don't know when this is going to end. We have a really good time right now where we can actually meet each other and see each other. But in the US, the pandemic is going up, at least in the areas where they measure. Um, and there was like this sadness, this thing that I saw really well described that it's about grief as well. Grief of the things we were used to. Grief of losing the connections that we had. Grief of our freedom. And I don't know, because this movie is old, if you've seen Groundhog Day, but the idea behind Groundhog Day is he keeps waking up on the same day. The same things happen. And then he needs to figure out, of course, how he gets out of this. But this also happened to us a lot during Corona, going from home. 
when we go to work, whether we drive or walk or take public transportation, even though we take the same route every day, we meet different people. Our brain starts to recognize, it goes like, oh, there's someone with blue hair. Oh, there's someone in a red shirt. Oh, there's someone here. So our brain notices all these things. When we move from our bed to the bathroom, to the kitchen, to the computer, that is the same all the time. We just do like this. So our brain doesn't really see it. Well, it sees it, but there's no point in saving it because it's the same. So we lost this sense of time and what was going to happen. And that affects our brain a lot. It affected people's mental health, also people who did not struggle with things before. And it affected people with mental health very much as well. And a lot of people started feeling unsafe because. So we became more raw, we became more sensitive. And we've been living under these strange conditions for two years. And one of the things that I see now as a manager and as someone that people confide in, um, because I talk openly about my issues sometimes, is that some people struggle getting back to being with other people. Some people go like, I used to be extrovert. Now I don't know how to start a conversation anymore. Or the first time you go into a place where there's more than three people, you go like, <gasps> there's people all around me and they're really close, even though they might not be. So we are sensitive. And once we start being sensitive and notice things, we also pull back a bit. And the thing is, this continues. When I looked at this, I kind of go like, why do I have these fires on the slides from 2020? Because there was big forest fires in Australia. I kind of forgot about that because so much other shit happened. We actually looked at maybe koalas would be extinct because we had so many fires. We had Brexit that is still affecting people. That's affecting people now. We have things in Ukraine. I'm not going to say more about that because we know. We had Black Lives Matter, which brought some good things, but also some terrible, terrible things. We have so many things that just feel so wrong and so stressful for us. And what happens when we have these things, unless we can just pretend they're not there, is that it also affects how we feel. So I talked before about comfort zone, and mostly when I speak about this, I use this, which is like a perfect circle. But that's not how it is. I'm not sure how this is going. Oh, it actually works really well. So this is my hand drawings, apologizing for that. So often we see it like this. But we will also have days where we have no place at all to move. Our comfort zone is this tiny on that day. Maybe you didn't sleep. Maybe you have a colleague or a friend or family who has really severe corona. Maybe something else happened that makes you very uncomfortable. And if you don't have a safe environment, that is going to be really scary. So what happens very much when we're in this situation is our comfort zone shrinks, but also our learning zone shrinks. And if you have one of these days to the, uh, let me see, to the left, um, you don't want to step very far. It's going to be like, if something happens uh, in writing in a Slack, you go like, fuck, everyone hates me, I'm going to leave. Because you feel so unsafe, you feel like it's an attack, maybe also because you can't see their body language. And then we have other days where we go like, the world is my oyster, I can do anything. And that's the difficult thing about this. But what, what the problem is with this is that what we've been living under the last few years and what we're still living under is how do we feel on that day? Because our comfort zone and the size of that and our learning zone and the size of that matters also for how easy it is for us to feel safe. And it was really interesting because I was talking to Justine last night about Nancy Klein, who wrote one of the best books um, that I know. Sorry if I forgot to mention that yesterday, which is called Time to Think, which I use very much about how do we create moments to think in a workplace. But what she also talks about is 
We have forgotten how to be uncomfortable. If somebody in front of you cries, that's not going to be comfortable. And what we tend to do, and especially us who come from some sort of natural science engineering background or whatever, go like, I need to solve that problem, so they stop crying. Everything will be fine, let's just fix this. And often what the other person needs is for us to be with them. We need to learn how to be in that uncomfortableness to make it safe to be in that uncomfortableness. Of course, not into the danger zone. And when I listen to people, when people confide in me, I am sometimes in my, uh, very much out of my comfort zone. Having to listen to people about things you never want to hear about, or having them cry in front of you. But I feel safe to do that because I know that I also have techniques where I can get rid of most of this. And I have friends that I can ask for help. And I am comfortable being uncomfortable, so to say. I'm okay with that. And I think part of that, being ready to be uncomfortable, is also part of what can create safety for others. So instead of fixing them, or trying to fix them, we actually listen to them. So how do we create safety? So I'm first going to take some stuff from Amy Edmondson. Uh, and like I said, I encourage you to watch her talk or, or read her book. So if you have an organization, you can look at the different domains. What is your attitude of risk and failure? How do you handle failure in your organization? For a very long time, um, or sometimes still, we see we have a zero-fault culture. That must be so scary, you can't make a mistake. Like, how do we handle that? One of the things he talks about is, if we can remove some of the failures, some of the risks that we know we can prevent. Like, physically, you can put on a hard hat, and then if something falls on your head, you're not going to be as damaged as if you don't have. At work, we can make small experiments so that if something happens, it's not going to have a big consequence. We can make automatic testing for some of the things that we keep repeating so that it will catch things so we can spend more time on the fun things. One of my developers says, we really need to make our code and uh, whole structure really boring because that means we can do all the fun things. So what is your attitude? If you have the attitude of we don't want failure um, and if you take risks, that's okay as long as it's a success then it's going to be unsafe. You need to have room for that. And then figure out, you know, how far can you go? What are you working on? Are you working on a fun tool for people to play games? Or are you working on X-Ray or MR software? You will take different risks, I hope. Um, so look at that. What is the willingness to help? So if people ask for help, or do people uh, offer help? Because if people are not very good at helping when you ask, you're going to stop asking. Which, again, makes it unsafe for you. It makes it unsafe for you to take on tasks because you can't get help. There's a lot of things in this. Do you have open conversations? Can you actually talk about, about things? Also, the uncomfortable things. Very often, we want everyone to feel nice. I feel like that's one of the problems in Sweden. It's also really cool because it's very nice, but sometimes we don't speak about things because we don't want it to be unnice. And sometimes we need, sometimes it's kind to actually have these discussions. Can we talk about things? Do we have inclusion and diversity? So diversity is when we have a bunch of different people. But sometimes when we have a bunch of different people, we just expect them to be like us. And Inclusion means we allow people to be who they are. We allow them to come in and we actually kind of celebrate and cherish. I mean, if we bring in somebody who's from a different university and we expect them to act like us, we're not going to get the benefit of that. Same with gender, age, whatever. If we don't have people in there and have them use the diversity, we're not going to get that. And also what happens sometimes is that people leave. 
A lot of people, for instance, talk about how do we get more women in IT, when one of the big problems is how do we keep more women in IT? And very often, if you are the only woman, you might not stay because it's not a safe environment. We actually struggle a little bit with the opposite. I now have a team with only women. We need to hire more male engineers. Um, never tried that before. But one of the things you can do, for instance, is bring in more of the same kind so that they don't feel unsafe, but also to do something to know that they are a part of this. She also talks about, as a leader, what you can do. And when she talks about it, I think most often she talks about being a manager. But I believe we are all leaders. If nothing else, we lead by example. So these are also things you can do, whether you are fresh out from university, starting to be in a project, whether you are an agile coach, a manager, whatever you are, you are also a leader, and you can choose to be a leader. So one of the first things you can do, I guess this is mostly as a manager, is you can frame work as learning, frame work as an experiment. Sometimes we talk about work as if we are in a factory and we are producing the same thing over and over and over again. We usually don't do that. We kind of produce the same things, but tech changes, people changes, the client changes. There's things that change all the time. We are actually learning. And that's part of also the risk part. Part of taking a risk is learning. Hey, I'm going to try this out. Oh, shit, that didn't work. That's a good learning. We're not going to go that way. Instead of going like, OK, that was really bad. Now we spend a week working on that or a month working on that. And again, one of the ways to, to decrease the risk of that is making it smaller. It's also about modeling curiosity. Be curious about things like, oh, that's really interesting. How come you're acting this way? Really interesting. What makes you think that this would be a better solution? And that, of course, you need to say probably going like, what makes you think this is going to be a better solution? It's not going to be helpful, but ooh, that's interesting. What makes you think this is a better solution? It's going to be better. So model that curiosity. Whether you are an individual, whether you are a group, try to figure this out. And that doesn't mean that we're going to necessarily go with the other way, but unless we go in and look into it, we are not going to get there. And show fallibility is the worst word. It took me like forever to learn it. But as a leader, show that you make mistakes. Show that it's OK to make mistakes. And this is something that can be really hard for a lot of managers, because like traditionally, we have often taken, oh, a manager, you become, you go upwards if you don't make mistakes, if you're the best at something, which is also a different thing I think we make wrong. It's like, oh, here's an amazing developer. Let's make him a manager. It's like, no, maybe we should take the guy who knows about people, but that's a different story. But talking about the things, the mistakes that we make, like I had planned to t tell you the names of the people doing the first research. But I couldn't remember. It's like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to try using dogs instead. Actually, the same dog in two different outfits. And, but then I couldn't remember their names. OK, that's my mistake. It's in the links. But by admitting that you do things wrong, that you make mistakes, that you are vulnerable, that also helps create safety. Because it doesn't help if you tell people, it's OK to speak up about these things. It's OK to make mistakes if you never, ever make one because we also learn what we see. It's like, um, I was talking to Eva about yesterday about cursing. You can tell your kids just as much as you want that they can't curse, but if you do it, they're going to learn it. That's how it works. You have to do things. You have to do these things to make people feel safe enough to do them themselves. You talk about if it's safe to curse or not, but that's a different story. So this is from me, like what I picked up. Um, Set clear expectations. That is essential to feeling safe. If you have to keep searching for the frames, then you're always going to be a little bit insecure. Some people in Agile talk about autonomous team being do whatever. But that's not what it is. It's actually do whatever within a frame. But often, we don't set those clear expectations. Also, because we want people to step up and take responsibility. But there are always frames. There are always expectations. And we might as well state them clearly. 
Like, we have very clearly a policy, we expect people to be in the office three to five days a week. Doesn't mean they can't challenge that, but now they know. We've made a list of things we expect of them. Then they can come to us and they can talk about this. Listen to people. Listen to hear people, not to respond. Care, truly care about people. Doesn't mean you need to be besties in your team, but if you don't care about the other people in your team, it's not gonna be safe for them to speak up. Give and receive feedback. Positive feedback, but also critical and negative feedback. Because this is how we learn and grow. Be vulnerable. Make yourself exposed. Show your heart. The original of, of courage is showing your heart. Whether that means, hey, I'm gonna jump out of an airplane and hope it's a parachute that I have on my back, or I'm gonna go to war and fight for my country, or I believe in test-driven development when nobody else does. That's also courage. Be vulnerable. Talk about things that is a bit scary. Can be part of helping other people talk about these things. Be curious. I really, that really changed the way I think about things when I discovered this, oh God, 15 years ago. Um, sorry for taking God's name in vain for those who care about that, I'm sorry. But realizing that if you can be curious about why people think differently, it doesn't work with all, there are people where I kind of go like, yeah, whatever. But being curious, and that helps people feel safe because you are interested in them. Listen to people, and truly listen to people. And repeat yourself. Because people don't hear things the first time. They won't hear things. Like, I read somewhere that if you make a strategy, when you've talked about it so many times you just want to puke, that's when people start listening. Because we can't take in everything, and even though we feel like we communicate things, repeat yourself, repeat your expectations, keep talking about them. Um, I'm gonna quote Marcin, who's gonna be speaking tomorrow. And um, this is from a time where we talked about making explicit uh, expectations, where he said, I forget sometimes that I role model more than I assume. And without clear expectations, I create wrong implicit expectations. So if we don't tell people our expectations, they are going to try and guess them. And then you can repeat yourself and set clear expectations, listen and care, give the feedback, be curious and vulnerable, and take care of people. And then sometimes when we have a crisis, we need to do a little bit extra. And the most important thing is be kind. Be kind to yourself as well. Take care of yourself. Eat healthy. Take enough breaks. This is something I really struggle with. So I'm suffering from post-COVID and my physical therapist says, block in at least a quarter before lunch and a quarter after lunch. And it's so hard because you can't go, oh, goodness, this and this, that. But taking breaks can also help us feel more safe because we have more headspace and more energy. Move from time to time. Um, especially something that I've struggled with sitting at home because I had a 46 square meter apartment. You don't move a lot in a 46 square meter apartment, but move a little bit. Watch your sleep habits. Is something changing? Do you get enough sleep? Limit intake of news because that can sometimes be painful or whatever it is that you follow that makes you struggle. Sometimes it's okay to just jump out a bit and not look at it. And be kind to yourself. Sometimes you will struggle and sometimes you'll have a terrible day and that's okay. Because you know you're gonna bump up again. So what are the things we can do for us because creating safety is very much about what we do. It is what we create for others. Create new working agreements if you are working from home or if you're working hybrid, or maybe there's things you need to do, especially around communication, because a lot of our communication moved to being written during Corona. And some of us still do a lot of this. 
And there's so much you can't read. We can use smiles a bit, but you can't read people's faces. You can't hear the tone in their voice. There's so much that you can't. How do we actually communicate? If we are working remotely, for instance, do we actually make the others aware that we are here right now? Like saying good morning, for instance, uh, or I'm just going to take a break. Things that when you're in an office you can see, but now we can't. If we're not working in an office, of course, with all the people, but we are not always. Talk about things. Talk about, hey, I had a bad day, or I feel really amazing today, so I might be a little bit annoying. Um, like, I can be really annoying if I'm very happy because I'll be all giddy and, and that. But talk about these things because it helps create a safer environment. If you had a terrible day and you are going to be angry that day or grumpy, if you tell people, I had a terrible day yesterday, I got some bad news, I didn't sleep well, so I'm going to be grumpy today, that means that when people ask you a question and you snap at them, they know that this is not because of what you said. It's because of how you are feeling that day. So bringing these things to the table can help create a safer environment. Be empathic. Know that most of us, everyone you see around you, is probably struggling with something. It can be big, it can be small, but we can only see it on the outside. I wrote a blog post the other day called Depression, what you see and what you don't. Putting up a picture where what you see is a smiling woman in a new shirt. But you don't see what's underneath. So be empathic and know that there might be more. And maybe pe people want to share that with you, maybe they won't. But at least try to be empathic about this. Be kind to people. Doesn't necessarily mean always be nice. Because if people are behaving in a way that is destructive for the collaboration, for instance, you need to tell them. But do it in a kind way. Some people think that if I don't tell them all the negative stuff, that's being nice or being kind. But it's not. It's being nice. How are they supposed to know? Like, how are we supposed to know things unless somebody tells us? So tell things, people. Make it okay to be in a bad place. But also still take responsibility for your actions. We can never choose how we feel, but we can choose what we do mostly. Of course, sometimes we snap, we react fast, we do something. And if we do that, step up to it and take responsibility and say, hey, what I did yesterday was not okay. Um, I apologize about that. So, wrap up of this, psychological safety is really important. It's not just important for us as humans, but it's important for us as organizations so that we get everything out of people, so that we get the ideas, so that we get motivated people, so that we take that risk that creates an awesome product or a failure, so that we know that at least. It does not always mean comfort. Sometimes I say that safety is actually allowing us to be uncomfortable, to go into those discussions, to go into that learning. When we are in crisis, we need it even more because our comfort zone becomes smaller. The way we react to things becomes smaller. It takes a lot of effort, actually, but it's totally worth it. And it's something you continuously need to work on, something you might need to address, but at least continuously work on. And no matter who you are, you can help create that safety. Maybe you are the newest one in a team, but if you go the first day and say, Phew, I am actually really nervous because I don't know how to do this, then you allow other people to also do the same things. We can all do these things. And sometimes it looks like some people are just in control of everything. And they, maybe they are in some of the things. Like Paul and I were talking about like when stuff happens that you can't control. And I'm like, I'm the kind of person to go like, yeah, if my slides disappear, I'll just talk for an hour. That would be fine. Uh, other people will be like, 
I don't know what I'm supposed to say because I need my slides. And we're all different, and that's okay. Um, and then, if somebody's feeling this way, you can say, hey, I know you're really nervous about this. You want me to step in and help you, for instance. You can help creating its safety, or if you still want to do it, I'm right here. You can look at me, I'll be right here. So we have five minutes to go. Um, what is also in my slides is my information. I love connecting, love having a cup of coffee. I will be here until tomorrow afternoon. But otherwise, if you want to ask something that you don't feel safe enough to do in this forum, just write to me. There's my email, there's my LinkedIn, there's my native Wyatt at Twitter. I respond to all of them as much as I can. I've been a bit slower because I've come into a depression and it takes a lot more energy than I used to. But I still appreciate all of this. And like I said, there are lots of links on these things. I can um, see that I mentioned a few more things that I will add and a lot of links to the amazing pictures that I took uh, and br brought into the presentation. So I think we have five minutes, right? Or four, if somebody wants to ask something. Uh, hi, Gita. Uh, my name is Dorota. Uh, it was a very nice talk. And since you have created such a safe place, I would like to ask you about your hair color. Um, is it simply a preference or is it some sort of statement? And I'm asking because we had a discussion with teachers of my child's school where hair color is not allowed. So that's why. Um, so I did it for fun first, so in, when I started speaking at conferences in 2013, I met people with awesome hair, like Susie, who's going to speak tomorrow. I was like, ooh, this looks really cool, I'm going to try it out. So I tried it out the first time in 2014, and I was like, this feels so natural. It was, it was such a weird feeling, it feels like this is who I've always been. And um, started out with blue, and then it would, like, as it faded, it turned into different shades of gray, uh, green. Now it's different shades of gray, but that's a different story. Um, but I, I realized I love this. I love that I, I'm not sure how my hair looks in a week. Then in 2016, I got this awesome dress in turquoise with pink, and I started combining the two colors. Um, and I don't... Some people say, oh, it's because you want to be noticed. But actually... Now it is because I don't care that people notice me. I love this, and most days I don't care what you think about it. Some days I'll be sad if you say something bad. Um, but I, for me, it's just a way of showing, or to myself, showing who I am, not to anyone else. But I do think it's a problem with, with hair that sometimes we are too strict. Uh, like one of the things I was really shocked to figure out is that in the US, for instance, you cannot have ethnical hair in a lot of places. Like if you are Afro-American, you cannot have like an Afro. So a law about that you cannot discriminate based on that was passed in California in 2019. Kids are still being sent home because they don't have correct hair in other states. And I think, I don't think that should be a problem. It's, you're not damaging anyone. You're not hurting anyone. If your kids want to have a blue stripe in their hair, that's not going to damage anyone. Um, so in my opinion, I think it's about that we don't embrace that difference that we have, the difference that makes us us. None of us are the same. And I think we need to embrace that more. Okay. Thank you so much. That was lovely. Thank you.